Welcome to the U.S. Department of Energy's live town hall on advancing U.S. leadership in wind, in, in wind energy. That would be energy derived from wind power. My name is Heidi Van Gendren, and it's my honor to direct the Office of Public Engagement here at the U.S. Department of Energy. We have a live audience here in our auditorium, and this event is being broadcast live online today. Thanks to those of you who are here in person, and thanks to those of you who are joining us at energy.gov slash live for tuning in. A brief word on the format of our town hall today. We will first hear opening remarks from each of our distinguished speakers, Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu and Senator Mark Udall, who will then spend a few minutes in further conversation with one another about the topic at hand. We will then open the floor for questions from you, our audience, which I will take the liberty of conveying to our distinguished speakers. We encourage both audiences, both uh, you here in the auditorium and those in you, of you in Cyberland, to ask questions during the event. For our cyber audience, you can tweet a question using hashtag AskEnergy, email a question to newmedia at hq doe.gov, or post a question in the comment section on DOE's Facebook and Google Plus pages, and there will be a prize for all of you who can remember the myriad venues through which you can submit a question. <laughs> for those of you who are with us today, you have been given index cards, and you are most welcome to jot your questions down at any time during the event, and there will be uh, folks along the edges of your rows to collect those questions. We also encourage you all to amplify today's event. The topic is an important one, and we encourage you to use your cyber and social media skills, whether it's through a blog, through your Facebook page, through tweeting, or if you're standing in a grocery store this weekend and you want to engage in idle conversation about the importance of public policy on expanding renewable energy, have at it. Wind energy, on to the main event. Wind energy is one of the great American success stories, and you'll hear greater detail about this from both of our speakers today. Whether it's the doubling of wind energy capacity in this country in just the past four years, or the rise of domestic wind manufacturing content from 35% to nearly 70% today in that same time frame, wind production has been a good news story for communities around this country from almost every angle you can think of, whether it's rural re revitalization, economic development and job creation, or more broadly, cleaner air. It's all good. The role of government and the policy platform that has helped this still young industry grow is a primary focus of today's event. And the role of government, more broadly in support of a, a burgeoning renewables industry, is also topic for conversation today. It is my distinct honor to introduce you to our now to our two nationally renowned champions. As United States Secretary of Energy, Dr. Stephen Chu is charged with helping to implement President Obama's ambitious agenda to invest in clean energy, reduce our dependence on foreign oil, address the global climate crisis, and create millions of new jobs. Dr. Chu is a distinguished scientist and co-winner of a Nobel Prize for Physics who has devoted both his scientific career and his leadership at DOE to the search for new energy solutions and stopping global climate change. It's been my honor to work for him over the last year, nearly a year, and I can personally testify to his extraordinarily facile grasp of all energy technologies. He also has a truly wonderful ability to translate immensely complex topics, whether scientific or technological, into terms that everyday people, like me, can actually understand. It is, it's an immense gift. Dr. Chu, thank you for your leadership on all fronts. Senator Mark Udall has served the people of my native state, Colorado, as a state legislator, a five-term member of the United States House, and now as U.S. Senator, where he has served since 2009. The Udall family, and Senator Udall in particular, have been well-known Western champions for the importance of respectful and sustainable use of natural resources and the rules and regulations that can help assure this. Senator Udall is known in particular for his ability to reach across party lines to build the necessary bipartisan support, an essential ingredient, for example, toward good energy policy. 
Colorado citizens took matters into their own hands regarding the state's renewable energy standards some years back by conducting a citizen initiative. And as one who was involved in that effort, as I was in Colorado at the time, I particularly remember Congressman, then Congressman Udall's leadership as co-chair of that successful campaign. Senator, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd now like to turn it over to Secretary Chu for his opening remarks. Well, first, uh, thank you, Heidi, uh, for that uh, uh, very nice introduction to the topic. Uh, I would have to say, um, uh, unabashedly, very bullish on the prospects for wind and the prospects for renewable energy in general. Uh, I think uh, many people think uh, that I haven't been following this technology, think, oh, well, this is all fine and good, but renewable energy like wind will always remain more expensive than uh, fossil forms of energy. So the good news is uh, not so, that there's been remarkable improvements in the technology in wind. And it is an American success story, but it was a, an American success story at the beginning. We lost uh, a dominance, uh, but we are getting it back. Very much like the fact that we invented the first airplanes, the Wright brothers, within 1904, within uh, a short decade, or even less than a decade, the lead had gone to Europe. And then after World War I, uh, where we were asked when we joined the war, don't build U.S. designed planes. Please build Allied designed planes, because ours are better. And we said, we the United States government said, you're right, we'll b build your British planes, French planes. But we, after the war, we said, we're going to get it back. A very similar story in the 70s, early 80s. We were pioneers in wind technology. It was just beginning. We didn't stick with it. The Europeans took it over, uh, in particular uh, the Danish, the Germans. And then we are coming back. And it's a very, very important that we do come back and we have to, and we need these policies because this means manufacturing jobs in America, this means supply chain jobs in America, this means clean energy, but mostly, it, most of all, it means clean energy that will com be competitive with perhaps a decade, maybe sooner with any form of fossil fuel, any new form of fossil fuel energy, including natural gas, even at relatively low prices of natural gas. So this is very, very good news. And we have to now prepare. This is coming down the road. So what do we need to do in order to prepare the country, the grid, uh, the systems to accept this power? Uh, you know, the fuel is free. The operation and maintenance costs are plunging as they get more reliable. The efficiency is still improving. I see another decade of technological improvements that will help bring the cost down. But it's still very important. And it, it, we're not quite ready, and it's still very important, and this is my plug, that we have to maintain the production tax credit, but, but uh, to keep this momentum going. And so it is highly important that we do this, and you know perhaps we can later discuss that. But that's that's my plug, and I'll stop now and uh, leave plenty of time for discussion. Thanks, Senator Heidi. Thank you, um, and Secretary Chu, for inviting me over this afternoon. I always, as, as I think all of you here, not only enjoy from uh, sitting in the Dr. Chu's presence, but I learn a tremendous amount. And we've already had about ten minutes ca catching up on battery technology, uh, the uh, latest on solar. Uh, technology, and of course, we've discussed uh, wind technology. Uh, Dr. Chu uh, is not only a scientific uh, historian, but he's a historic scientist, uh, as you all know. And the country has been so well served these last four years uh, by his uh, taking the helm of the uh, Energy Department. Uh, I think so. President Obama chose uh, wisely. Uh, I can't tell you; I've got a commitment from Secretary Chu to serve another four years. Uh, but uh, whenever he uh, decides that his tenure here uh, is completed. We're all going to be so grateful, uh, Steve, to what you've done and accomplished. Um, the uh, state of Colorado, and Heidi uh, and I proudly hail from Colorado. I see some other Coloradans, by the way, Dr. Chu, out here in the audience, has an all-of-the-above energy approach. Uh, we're blessed with uh, abundant coal in the northwestern corner of the state. Of course, there's quite a bit of natural gas development underway. We have a lot of free fuel uh, in the in the sun and the wind, uh, we increasingly are experimenting with uh, geothermal technologies. And of course, we have the National Renewable Energy Laboratory based 
in Colorado. And again, thanks, thanks to you all for continuing to support uh, that important uh, laboratory. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, go over the top and tell you that Colorado is the only uh, state where this is underway. But the good news is a lot of states are pursuing an all-above energy uh, approach. Uh, but we're, we particularly see it as meeting the combination of factors that Heidi mentioned, the trio, if you will, of environmental protection, job creation, and national security. I serve on the Armed Services Committee as well as on the Intelligence Committee. Uh, by the way, my children say the Intelligence Committee is an oxymoron, particularly if you serve in the Congress, but we'll talk about that uh, later. And uh, we, we see increasingly the opportunity in the world of uh, military doctrine uh, using our armed forces, the, the, the opportunities with renewable energy at places like Fort Operating Bases in uh, Afghanistan. The Navy is undertaking a very robust effort. I know, I know Dr. Chi, you've been very involved in that uh, with Secretary uh, Mabus. So in sum, um, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I uh, consciously didn't talk a lot about the PTC and the wind industry because I know that's going to be a, the subject here over the next 45 minutes or so. But uh, let it be known that uh, Colorado's wind uh, energy industry is alive and well. We, we both uh, harvest the wind and produce the technology that lets us harvest the wind. And Secretary Chu's point about supply chain opportunities in manufacturing are really uh, crucial, not just to those of us in Colorado, but to the entire country. 8,000 parts in, mm -hmm. in a wind turbine. And those parts are produced by small, <coughs> medium, and large sized businesses. And when America manufactures, America's going to be strong. So, Heidi, thanks for. Indeed. Inviting me, and I look forward to the conversation and the questions. Indeed. Um, do you gentlemen from your respective perches have any uh, salient um, questions to ask one another before we open it up to questions that have come in? Well, I'll uh, ask the Senator, um, um, since I already mentioned it, and, <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know I, I know you're, you're very much in favor of uh, those policies that actually give that long-term signals to industry and to the private sector to invest in America. And uh, how do you feel that's going uh, in Congress? <laughs> <laughs> Not as well as it could, but there are certainly some promising signs that uh, we in the Congress understand that investment in R&D, in an infrastructure, in educational opportunities uh, then lead to uh, investments more broadly in our economy. One of the reasons I believe, uh, Steve, that it's just so important to get a grand bargain when mm -hmm. it comes to our fiscal condition is that we'll then create an architecture that allows us to have uh, spirited and important debates, Heidi, about what our priorities are. But we've been in this limbo, if you will, for the last uh, year to year and a half to two years, you could argue, because revenues aren't matching commitments the federal government has. There, there is a way forward. I think the Simpson-Bowles uh, approach makes uh, great sense. And I'm optimistic we'll put such a plan in place, and that will send a strong message to the world that we're open for business, uh, that we are going to invest in our future, uh, but we're also not going to put a, uh, push on debt uh, to our children and our grandchildren that's, that's unsustainable. Let me end on this note, uh, and this is close to my heart and close to my head and close to Colorado and close to the country's future, and the doctor talked about this. We do need to extend the production tax credit. That would be a, a strong statement that we are mm -hmm. investing, that we do understand the importance of maintaining our leadership in the world when it comes to new energy technologies. How it's going to happen, I don't know. I hope somebody here maybe has a little more clear crystal ball than I do. But to Senator Baucus, the Finance Committee, the Senate at large knows the importance of extending the PTC. There's bipartisan support for it. Uh, Chairman Grassley, uh, I should say now Ranking Member Grassley, uh, is the father of the PTC. and He's joined forces with me and a lot of other Democrats and Republicans. So. Keep rooting for us. Uh, it's important for a whole host of reasons that we extend the PTC. Would it be untoward to ask one of you to give the audience just a, a brief primer, especially those in cyber, cyber land, as to um, the importance of the PTC? What does this measure do precisely? I'll give it my best, and then, uh, then I've got my, uh, my backup here. Production tax credit, which has, by the way, been used to encourage the production of natural gas in the past. Uh, basically provides for a two and a half cent, 2.2 uh, cents uh, on kilowatts produced, and that's the important part of the PTC. It's it's not a speculative tax credit. It's not uh, uh, suggesting that people's good behavior might be uh, rewarded at some point. It's tied directly 
uh, to kilowatts produced. And it's had a magnificent uh, effect in creating a market, uh, not just in locales uh, uh, in, in certain states, but more broadly around the country. Uh, it's helped uh, not only producers, but utilities uh, get more engaged. And it's also given uh, opportunities to uh, small scale wind producers to get into the marketplace. So uh, all across the board, I don't think you can argue with the success of the production tax credit. And I'm sure Dr. Chu could elaborate or correct what I just said. Uh, you said nothing wrong, uh, so <laughs> let me just add. Uh, uh, so in the last two years, we've added about 10 gigawatts of wind capacity. Um, right now, in, as we enter into 2013, uh, what we have is uh, sort of on hold. There have been a lot of factories that have been built in the United States. And a lot of supply chains have been geared up, and things are on hold. And if this production tax credit is continued, uh, those things, there will be enough confidence in the supply chain, in the manufacturers, to say, okay, you know, America's serious, we're going to continue. I'm afraid, and this is again a crystal ball, so you don't really know, but I'm, I'm very concerned that if it is not continued, uh, a lot of manufacturing capability uh, will say, well, look, okay, America and North America is not going to be serious about this. We can, we can yank the production facilities and move them elsewhere. And so that would, to recover from that, would take a lot. And so right now, it, uh, I feel uh, that it is very crucial that we just go on and do this uh, so that you preserve the manufacturing capability that uh, this demand is is inherently there. As I said, the prices are coming down nicely. But let's not panic. Let's just say, hey, just stay the course, and uh, and we'll be in a very good situation. Again, this is this is economic opportunity. This is mid, short, long-term economic opportunity, and and we should also really be focused on that fact. Heidi, if I might add, Please. one of the great experiences. Doctor, I had recently was in Pueblo at the Vestas plant in Pueblo. They build the towers there, and just the pride in the people who work there when they see the, their handiwork that then produces American-grown energy is really inspiring. A lot of the men and some women who work at the factory were previously employed in the steel industry in Pueblo. The Pueblo is known as a steel town, but for a lot of reasons that you all are aware of, the steel industry has become more and more competitive and many steel mills have been shut down. But we've been, and I think there's a similar story in Pueblo to what's happening in the, in the Midwest of our country and right. other traditionally uh, manufacturing focused areas. But it, you, you visit with those uh, employees, benefit packages are nice, but what's, what's most uplifting is, is that they're just their sense of pride in using their hands to manufacture these machines which are marvels mm -hmm. of uh, 20th and 21st century American ingenuity. We have a mix of questions, uh, both on the technology and policy side. So I'm, I'm going to demonstrate my lack of facility as a moderator and just start firing questions at you, gentlemen. <laughs> In those two categories, I'll take broadly. policy and the okay, doctor that's what takes I'm thinking. technology there, and there may science. Be a nice <laughs> no, we can swap. <laughs> we can swap. <laughs> <laughs> there may be a nice division of labor here. <clears throat> um, a question from one of our cyber listeners. Uh, do we know how much fossil fuel power plant emissions have been displaced by the gigawatts of wind, Dr. Chu, that you've uh, mentioned? Oh, uh, you know, I can't really quote an exact number, but uh, I would say that uh, in Right now, uh, we have, in terms of renewable energy, if you count hydro, it's roughly 6% of our electricity output. Uh, you take wind and solar now, it's, it's getting into the 5 6% range as well. Um, five, 10 years ago, it was 1%. Uh, or you know, 10 years ago, certainly, it was not a real contributor. So on the percentage basis, but if you, so I can tell you on a percentage basis that it's been good news, but it can't be taken for granted. And again, uh, we should continue to keep our attention to this. Again, it's, um, it's a false choice to say that either we develop clean energy sources and uh, mitigate the worst risk of climate change, or we have uh, inexpensive energy. That is a false choice. You can have your cake and eat it too, because the wind is going to be coming down. Solar is coming down dramatically as well. 
And there was a second part that you may have just addressed partially to this question, which was at what cost has wind come on to utility systems? Um, <clears throat> And uh, and as in dollars per kilowatt hour, you mentioned the declining cost. But considering, and here's here's a, a, a wind fact from the questioner, mm -hmm. that uh, wind farms generate mostly at night, the power they generate when the wind blows, when the value of electricity is the least. Cool. Can I start and then yes, hand please, please. Senator? Yeah. Um, first, yeah. while, while yes, that's true, we have um, uh, a distribution system and we have a country that can actually handle this, at, certainly at the level where it's at today. And in fact, if it doubles or triples, uh, without energy storage, we can have a distribution system that can accommodate significantly more wind. Now, what cost? Uh, right now, if you look at what the costs are, you take out the production tax and other things, it appears that it's around 7, 7.2 cents average per kilowatt hour. Okay. So let's compare costs. Right now, the cheapest form of new energy, I'm not talking about a power plant that's built 15 or 30 years ago, totally depreciated, but the cost of new energy, uh, the lowest cost is natural gas. And o over the next 20 years, the uh, EIA, uh, the Energy Information uh, Agency, it's a, a semi-autonomous part of the Department of Energy, says that uh, they're going to cross, okay, in costs. Uh, so, uh, uh, now it depends on who you talk to. Jeff Immel, GE says it, it's going to get down to five cents a kilowatt hour uh, in less than a decade. But even if you're pessimistic and say it's only going to get down to six cents, this is incredible good news. And so, this is something that, as I said, becomes very competitive. And depending, you know, Yogi Berra said it's a, predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, we have a couple of decades of experience <coughs> curves that show that this trend is continuing. And so that's, that's actually good news. And so the costs are, are again, mm -hmm. we have ample evidence. It's not wishful thinking. And the f best news is you look at what the technologists are doing in terms of higher reliability, going to direct drive, higher towers, lower maintenance costs, better designs, better efficiency, you have technological headroom for about a decade. And so you don't see the lowering of this and say you bottom out is as good as it gets. So you get at least 10 years of better stuff. And that's why it's so exciting. Secretary's vision and, and scientific knowledge uh, in, in effect becomes policy. That's why I love sitting with him when you, when you listen to the, the, the way in which he creates a, a, ne a nexus of uh, the opportunity, the history, and where technology meets all that. Heidi, two things I'd say, and, and I want to acknowledge up front that sometimes we talk about energy and we don't separate out transportation fuels and electricity. Uh, and, and I want you all to know I, that I'm not intending to do that here. But think about the externalities uh, of fossil fuel dependence, particularly when it comes to oil. But also think about one of the visions that we all share, which is a more electrified transportation system. And as we produce uh, more electrons in a, in a cleaner lower carbon way, then that expands our capacity to move to an electric-based transportation system in some significant percentage. That's number one. Number two, Heidi mentioned in Colorado Amendment 37, which created an RES, a Renewable Electricity Standard in, in Colorado, which is now 30 percent by the year 2020. We started out with 10 percent by the year 2020. A group of us Republicans and Democrats, Doctor, went to the voters in Colorado and said, you know, this is going to cost a little bit more. <coughs> But we think this is the future, again, uh, when it comes to job creation, environmental protection, and national security. And I see uh, one of the leading uh, utilities in the country, XL, is here. And XL joined forces uh, with all of us and added some, some programs and options for consumers uh, where you paid a little bit more of a premium, but the marketplace spoke. So Coloradans were willing to pay a little bit more to, be to benefit in the ways I just outlined. So, Yes, new technologies generally always cost more. Think about cell phones or the numerous uh, medical d devices and on and on and on. But uh, this is uh, well worth uh, the investment in my opinion. A, a, a slightly broader question. The expiration of the PTC is incredibly detrimental to wind turbine manufacturing industries and its supply chain. 
but on the assumption that we can extend the PTC, what else do we need to do to expand the domestic wind industry? Well, I'll Long begin. Um, a couple of things. First, uh, transmission distribution is a critical part of that. Uh, the amazingly good news in the United States is we have incredible wind resources, perhaps some of the best in the world. Uh, we also have incredible um, uh, solar resources. Uh, another good news is um, we're in the areas where we have these resources that require land. Uh, we actually have uh, not densely populated areas, okay? It's a very different situation in, in let's say, parts of Europe. Uh, so the good news is that you can put wind turbines uh, in places which are not very populated. The bad news, uh, they're in places that are not very populated. Yeah. So you've got to get the energy to people. And so transmission distribution systems, streamlining the way, you know, the, how do you cite the lines, how do you get local approval and, and buy-in for that, and actually how do you do that in, in a timely manner is one thing. Another thing is that we have incredible wind resources offshore. Uh, and the, but the issue there is, right now, it's candidly not as inexpensive. Uh, the biggest issue being uh, the corrosion of a, of a salt air environment. Mm -hmm. um, we're not letting us, we're investing in this. We think that it's a technologically uh, surmountable problem. But then you have, again, on a whole set of new re uh, resources of renewables now near population centers. But, but that's the technological issue I think we can solve. Uh, transmission distribution is a known issue, but we, there are all sorts of stakeholders that have to be engaged and, and, and brought along on that. And, but that's also something that, again, public policy uh, is a very important part of the solution. One additional opportunity might be as we extend the PTC, and I'm speaking as if, as if it will be extended, is that we then look to the next generation of market-based incentives. And there are no ideas that are uh, being surfaced and, and floated right now, the applying master limited partnership concepts to renewable energy uh, companies, uh, looking at how the investment uh, tax credit is uh, uh, utilized for particularly capital-intensive uh, industries and then there's uh, Senator Bingaman's clean energy standard concept that's circulating and then finally there's uh, the RIC which I think some of you in the audience are probably could explain uh, uh, with more facility than I than I could off the top of my head but that that's an, a mechanism that would uh, reward utilities for bringing more uh, renewable electricity uh, onto the grid and there are economists and others that think it may have real reach uh, as we move into this next era of renewable energy development. So those, those are some ways in which not just wind, but renewable technologies of all kinds would be further encouraged. For the uh, audience out there, I know, probably know most of you know what a master limited partnership is, but, um, but let me just factually explain. You can have what's called a partnership where a group of investors want to invest in something. Uh, and that partnership is actually, the flows come from the partners into a business and comes back. A master limited partnership um, allows a wider class of investors to participate. Ordinary citizens can say, okay, I want to buy a share of a master limited partnership, for example, in a particular project like uh, a pipeline. It's not a particular pipeline, but uh, Kinder Morgan, which makes a lot of pipelines in the United States, is a master limited partnership. You can buy shares in that. They give you returns on your capital. Uh, it actually makes the cost of capital for pipelines much lower. And it's pretty good returns uh, last year, about 6.8% uh, return on a very safe investment. And so the discussion in Congress now is whether uh, those massive limited partnership structures which are available to fossil fuels, the fossil industry, oil, coal, gas pipelines, should also be made available to renewable industries, wind, solar, and other renewables, to just to level the playing field. If it is made available, the cost of financing goes way down. And if the cost of financing goes way down, guess what? The cost of wind goes way down. Because the most expensive part of any renewable is the capital cost. 
you've got to borrow money to do this stuff. And so this, this means it goes down from the 10, 12, 15% equity finance, which is where it comes from today, to 5, 6%. It's a world of difference, okay? And it will have a profound impact on capital private sector investments. So a lot of it sitting on the sidelines gets unleashed and will spur the demand in the industry. So that's a, uh, I'm just explaining the concept of master limited partnership. Heidi, I'd, maybe I could ask the Secretary of Paul on Please. question. If I might, I, I talked about getting a grand bargain when it comes to the country's fiscal future. One of, one of the uh, comments and concerns you hear from the business sector is the uncertainty that exists in a lot of policy areas. Now, there's always uncertainty, and that's uh, endemic to a capitalist free society. But one of the uh, comments you hear on a, in a follow-on basis is when, when the, most business people are optimistic brought in the long term that we're going to get a deal. But a lot of those business people say, once you get a deal, we're going to bring this $2 trillion of cash we've got on our balance sheets uh, into the marketplace. Doctor, I wonder if you, if you think, based on what you've seen, if that, some of that cash on balance sheets is going to come into this, this very world that you're, we're discussing uh, here today. Well, I think, uh, again, you know, you know, it's up to Congress. Um, but I think if Congress does move on this, it, there are, there is a lot of money on the sidelines. Right now, uh, if you want to make a super safe investment, well, Treasury notes. But that's, you know, one or two percent interest. Um, then, if you want to do the stock market, well, there's real risk. I mean, it's a volatile market. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, candidly, including myself, if you have uh, the stability and the safety that you see in these massive limited partnerships, but they bring in five or six percent, you know, hey, I'll take that, right? And it's also something I believe in. So, so there's there's a lot of uh, money on the sidelines looking for very safe investments that don't want to you know go in and, and uh, invest in stocks uh, or solely in stocks you need a diversified portfolio it's not only true of individuals but it's true of pension funds it's true of a lot of other uh, groups and so that's the opportunity that one has before us if, if, if one could uh, but it's uh, something before Congress up to us. Yeah. it's up to that's up to these guys <laughs> Have I got a deal for you? <laughs> Senator, in addition to the, uh, the litany of policies that you described, we have a question from someone in the audience here today that uh, notes, in addition to the PTC, domestic manufacturers supplying components for the clean energy sector would also benefit greatly from the Advanced Energy Manufacturing Tax Credit, which expired in 2011. How, how do you both view uh, the future of that credit? Any opportunity there? Is that part of the uh, A tool that should be in the toolbox? In an ideal world, it would be a part of the <coughs> toolbox. My focus is on the PTC, and uh, I'm pretty single-minded about it. If you all have been subject to my 28 speeches on the floor of the Senate, highlighting an individual state every time I go to the Senate floor, and I think I'll be back there tomorrow uh, talking about Hawaii. Uh, we're going to get that PTC extended. Then in a broader <coughs> conversation, yeah, we ought to look at what's worked. Yeah, I, I look forward to, by the way, to Senator uh, Wyden and Senator Murkowski's partnership on the Energy Committee uh, as the new Congress is seated. Look, to, to that, I'll add, um, uh, you know, what the Senator said you know, some time ago. Um, uh, we, we, we do have uh, fiscal responsibilities. And uh, the emergency takes this very, very seriously. And so you can't have everything and everything that you want. And so if you start to prioritize what you want uh, or what you think is the, is the highest value, I think uh, you look to those things that have the greatest leverage. Uh, you know, I personally agree with you that the production tax credit has incredible leverage. Uh, and again, it's not going to be needed uh, forever. Yeah, forever. And the other thing is things like uh, massive limited partnerships, which uh, really don't explicitly use taxpayer money because it's, take, it's providing a private sector opportunity for investment that would not have been made. And so things like mm -hmm. that uh, have a lot of uh, leverage in terms of 
what it will stimulate in terms of the growth in our economy, what will stimulate in terms of those things that give lasting capability to our economy in a way that doesn't actually have that much consequence to the Treasury. And so, again, those are, so one has to focus on those steps that really can make a difference in a limited budget scenario. A technology question uh, that, that focuses on the need to modernize the grid. Um, the questioner asks, can the grid be modernized? And back to your question uh, or your observation on the role of, of the public sector in a policy platform that would unleash private sector investment. Uh, can the grid be modernized with the current group of private enterprises or will it have to be a public, be made a public utility? I don't think we fully know. I would tell you that when the Energy Committee did uh, a lot of detailed work in the 09-010 time frame and created, I think, a, a product that was defensible and forward-looking and far from perfect, I, I should add, there was a, a significant provision to try and cut through some of the uh, red tape and the regional differences uh, and create some ultimate decision makers in, ma in making uh, when it comes to modernizing our grid. Uh, I don't think, though, we've, we've figured out quite uh, how to get it done, whether about 250 RTOs, uh, regional trans transmission organizations, and it's a complex federalized, if you will, system uh, that we had. But I'd welcome from the viewers and listeners uh, ideas. And now I'm going to turn to the doctor because I think he's probably figured this out. And he maybe has <laughs> the, the, the solution right at his fingertips. Well. Um, no, I don't have a solution at my fingertips, but, but let me just tell you um, that uh, uh, the first thing you have to ask yourself always is, is it possible to actually get what we have to be much better? And if you can do that, uh, and you don't have to do radical <coughs> surgery, if you will, it, it might be better. I don't really know, but uh, we've started convening all the stakeholders. Uh, utility companies, uh, people responsible for the transmission distribution, the merchant suppliers of energy, all the, the regulators, uh, because this is a state regulated and locally regulated business. Uh, there are great opportunities. First off, let me just say that the first opportunity is if the transmission distribution people with the power generators actually share very important data. This is technical data having to do with what is happening to their lines, the so-called the 60 cycle phase. Uh, we will be much more robust against blackouts and cascading blackouts. And uh, the good news is, actually due to Recovery Act investments, uh, we've been distributing these so-called synchro phasers. And we are trying to get all the power companies to say, let them be available at least this very important phase information. So it turns out that you can have some instability start up somewhere in, actually this is actually a true story, it starts in Canada. It goes into the transmission systems, right? And it's, its tail end is oscillating in Florida. And you want to damp out these oscillations as quickly as you can, where otherwise they grow. And it's these oscillations that lead to these cascading blackouts. Okay, so number one, robust grid. Number two, there's money to be made by everybody. Because if you can use your assets better, your transmission and generation assets across boundaries, let's say you have a shortage, I've got a temporary surplus. I can sell you, you know, and we can both, um, ha we have to invest less in less backup if we're allowed to swap. And that's where, so what you want is a, a complete system uh, that integrates fossil fuels, existing generation plants, with new renewables. And as energy storage, as it will, gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, you have to integrate that into a complete grid system and a distribution system that goes across those regional transmission boundaries that the senator was talking about. So you have automatic balancing, imbalancing, swapping. And everybody will actually can save money, save investment, and, but, but the issue is how do you bring this 
because you know many companies you know this is confidential information this yeah. is this is very important for my local business I don't want to share it and so one of the things is how do you encourage people to begin to share that so that uh, everybody gains Dr. Chu and I were talking before we all gathered uh, about the potential for distributed generation. Many of you in the room are familiar with that concept, and I think we will see the growth of some distributed generation, which by its very nature uh, does not need long transmission corridors or lines to, to uh, be available. Uh, and as that unfolds, particularly in certain areas of the country where there's abundant wind or so, so particularly sun, you may see some interesting challenges for for the incumbents, for utilities and other power providers, as, as some of us have more and more an interest in producing power on our own on our own homes and in our own businesses. I think it's a problem we'd probably like to have, but it still will well, bring some challenges. But, right? but again, it's a false choice. Don't don't say yeah. to yourselves, you, you're yeah. going to be distributed generation or a big interconnected grid. Choo, you choose. You want both. And, and, uh, and so you need a big interconnected grid for the backup, the stability, everything else. Uh, but you can, you're going to have distributed generation as uh, rooftop solar becomes less and less expensive. Uh, already companies are beginning to convert to uh, gas generators or fuel cell generators that would generate their own electricity. Uh, we need new business models for the transmission distribution companies and the utility companies. Otherwise, they see a dwindling uh, supply chain, but we need to think about those things. Mm -hmm. So these technologies are going to change the world. Uh, we've got to do this and think about this today because it, it's, it's going to be very important. Uh, you don't, we don't want to be like the publishing industry and all of a sudden <laughs> some technology has come and uh, it's, there's collateral damage. And especially in the cost of energy, we want to keep the cost of energy. Uh, you know, to promote industry, we want to keep it low, we want to keep a stable system. But these are, these are uh, problems that uh, we have to think about. Uh, and it's again, it's going to be both. It's going to be distributed generation and storage, plus uh, an interconnected grid. Is there a <clears throat> parallel, Doctor, with the way data flows now from belt based and uh, purse based smartphones to still central computer systems to everything in between? Is, that, is there an analog there with what you're, you're describing? Well, um, with energy, you've got a lot of different systems that we want to try and integrate. We, there is an analog in that the fact that technology has really transformed the way we use and information, the way we transmit information that has profound implications in publishing, in entertainment, music, uh, film, video, you name it. Um, there is uh, your smartphones are the chips in your smartphones, the computer in your smartphones are, are more capable than what used to be on desktops uh, let's say, a decade and a half ago. What used to be on mainframe computers 25 years ago. And this is going to continue. Uh, but in, actually, um, there's a lot of stuff in your smartphone that's actually communicating to, quote, the cloud, the cloud <laughs> yeah, the air, that, yeah. that uh, you are very, very connected to. So you've got in your possession, you carry around with you a very capable computer, but its lifeblood is also in the cloud, and uh, you know these, like Siri and other things, there are voice recognition patterns. They're actually communicating up there. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> up there in this brave new world, we, gentlemen, we are running out of time. Oh. I just want to ask one final question. We have a number of wonderful questions in the queue that we will not have gotten to, and we apologize to those of you who submitted and did not hear your question. But uh, final question: How can we ensure women and minorities? are involved in wind energy jobs? My take uh, would be that we need to continue to invest in and support particularly community colleges, uh, vocational opportunities, uh, as well as emphasizing the STEM disciplines uh, in those institutions and, and institutions that uh, draw our eyes more readily, uh, the land-grant college universities and uh, state universities. But there are uh, a number of uh, excellent uh, programs in Denver and in Colorado, places like uh, Red Rocks Community College, down Adams State, which is down in the valley, Alamosa, which has one of the most uh, uh, exciting solar resources because mm -hmm. it's high elevation, cool ambient air temperatures, and 320 days of sun. Uh, and in many of those locales, 
the feedback loop is uh, becoming more well developed, Heidi, when it comes to those employers' needs, <coughs> working with that community college or that vocational school to quickly train up uh, people in those communities to, to be a part of this new energy economy. And in many cases, it, it, that includes women in our state, Hispanics, African Americans. Uh, and so that, that, that this certainly is, is an opportunity that would be is available to all Americans. And it's again why I'm so passionate about the future and why I love listening to Dr. Chu's vision because this is happening. I mean, there are some naysayers and there, there are people who are beholden to the incumbents and uh, can't really see the future. But this is happening. This is, this is our future. We've seen great growth in IT and telecom, increasingly in the biosciences. Uh, clean energy and low carbon energy is uh, the next big thing, in my opinion, and that's why it's just so important for America to invest in its people, make capital, uh, provide opportunities for capital to be deployed, as the doctor described and continue to do the research and development that's done so powerfully here, Doctor. Thank you for that and to all the universities and all your partners because that combination uh, will mean that America wins the global economic race, which in the end that's what this really should be focused on is how do we compete economically? How do we provide jobs for our people? When we provide jobs for our people, then the values we hold dear that are enshrined in the Declaration of Independence continue to be alive and well. It's, it's, it's this beautiful, important, magnificent combination of a, of a high, solid standard of living combined with the, the freedoms that we uh, sometimes take for granted but are just central to, uh, to the American experience. And why every human being, now I'm being probably um, maybe a little bit hyperbolic, but I think why every, every human being I've ever met uh, admires America, and I think everybody is an American in their, in their core. But we, we have that work to continue to do. Let me repeat in slightly different words what the Senator <laughs> said because it's worth repeating. Um, when you ask a question about uh, how do you get women and minorities into a particular industry, uh, it goes back to the fact that what you really have to look at is how do you instill in all Americans uh, the, the notion that they have the opportunity and the educational opportunities, K through 12, uh, you know, junior colleges, four-year colleges, and beyond, and that you can make a livelihood, whether it's in any part, in the manufacturing, in the installation, in the engineer design, in the scientific research that uh, goes into the new technologies. Uh, women and minorities uh, should be not only encouraged to do this, this is taking full advantage of the human capital we have in the country to actually say, yes, there's huge segments that uh, should be actively encouraged to do this. And let me end with a little story. I was a professor at Stanford, and I was put at uh, a very small committee. Uh, this was in the, um, uh, I think, late 1990s or somewhere in the mid-1990s. And w this committee was charged uh, with how do you uh, get more women into the professorate at Stanford, but not only how do you get them in, how do you, mm -hmm. how do you retain them? How do you make sure they're successful? And what can we do? Because even if you bring them in as assistant professors and you look at the statistics at that time, there was a higher dropout rate. And so it was a very distinguished committee. Um, and um, for example, um, Condoleezza Rice was on this committee with me and she stayed on until she became provost and all of a sudden she would have to receive the report. So she had to step off the committee. So about a half a dozen of us looked at this. And the recommendations we came up with were actually amazingly simple. In order to retain women faculty, you should do certain things. But those things would actually be good for all junior faculty. And in so, and as the, the university actually incorporated those things, the retention went up for women. Okay, for example, you know, that baby, take a year off, stop the tenure clock, you know. You know, you give more support, things like that. You can, you know, incorporate a little bit of balanced lifestyle into this, but it's also turned out to be good for all faculty. And so, in actual fact, and go back to your question, the things that kept women and minorities into this will be good for all Americans. Okay, and it's really taking advantage of all the capital assets we have, which is our people, which is our biggest asset. 
And that's something we should always remember, that the investment in any fiscal hard times, R&D investment in the education of the future is where we have to have priorities. Well said. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for okay. your leadership on this. <laughs> We look forward to a happy ending on the production <laughs> tax credit as well as uh, robust policy support for renewables going forward. Thanks to everyone here. Thanks to people in Cyberland. And for those of you uh, who know people that did not see this today, it will go up onto energy.gov tomorrow to be consumed by future generations. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.